angels and the elders bow. The redeemed worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I won't need that after all, Deacon Joy. Jesus is here right now. Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. I mentioned earlier about the session that we had with the young people on suicide, and there, there are some handouts that we had, and they're in the back on the bin, so if anybody wants a copy of that, you can pick one up in the back. I wanted to mention that. There is a word from the Lord for today, and if you will turn with me, and also, actually, we, we have it projected so you can look at it there, or in your Bibles, turn to Colossians, the letter to the people of Colossae, or um, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to get there myself. And I'm going to actually read from verse 1 through verse, let's see, 10, 11. I'll read through 11. Colossians chapter 3. In the New International Version, it starts by saying, Since then, you have been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Verse 11 says, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. We're going to lift up for purposes of today's messages, verses 5 through 10. It starts with the words, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we pray your presence here in this place, that you will continue to stay with us and sup for a while for we need a word from you. Speak now, O God, for we, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Our topic for today's conversation is kill it. K-I-L-L, -L, kill it. The Bible says in no uncertain terms, in Exodus 20, and Deuteronomy 5, commonly known as the Ten Commandments. There in verses 13 of Exodus 20 and 17 of Deuteronomy 5, it says, Thou shalt not kill. 
or your translation might say, thou shalt not murder. And we know from years of living and years of studying God's word and listening to sermons and attending Bible studies and other classes that God abhors, God despises, God hates when we do evil against our brothers and sisters. When we seek to kill or destroy them physically or even figuratively with our tongues or with our intentions. Like Jesus talked about in the New Testament when he talked about uh, murder and killing being more than an overt act. He talked about how we can murder each other in our hearts with the things we say and do. In Matthew 5, he says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, or it's a, that's a term of contempt or dislike, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So Jesus' words from Matthew 5, verses 21 through 22. Also, Proverbs 18 and 21, which we studied in Bible study, says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And in the Message Bible, Proverbs 18 reads, Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. James 3 and 5 says the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Says there with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, he says, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So it is clear in scripture that God is against murder. God is against killing of someone or something for an unjust cause. But in the case of Colossians 3, I hear God explicitly telling us that there are some things that we have to kill, some things that must be put to death if we're ever going to walk in the fullness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a killing that needs to go on, a killing of those things that are ungodly and those things and behaviors that steal our joy and cause us to give up God's promise in our lives. Paul lists them there in verses 5 and 8. He says we need to put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, and he calls all of those idolatry or worshiping something other than God. Then he says we have to put away anger, rage, Malice, slander, filthy language, lying to each other. Paul says you used to walk in these things in the life you once led. He says, but in your new life as a Christian, as a Christ follower, as an imitator of Christ and not just a churchgoer, he says now you must take some things off, put some new things on. You have to put some things to death so you can walk in your new life victoriously. All throughout Paul's writings in this chapter, I could not help but think about the grace of God that meets us right where we are, but calls us to a higher place. That God the Almighty, the one who truly is holy and who is without any sin, God meets us through Paul's words in Colossians 3, right where we are, right in our sinful state. 
And he doesn't judge us. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't sentence us to a life of destruction and despair. God calls us out of our old place, our old self, into a new and a blessed place in him. You know, people are always talking about how churches are dying now because we fail to keep things relevant. We are failing to speak to people where they really are and where they really live. And to a certain extent, that criticism is fair. It's true. Many people didn't grow up in church like maybe you or I did. Many people didn't fall in love with the church as a little child like some of us did. Many people didn't have parents who went to church or made it a priority in their life like maybe some of us did. We live in a world now where people want and need to know that this God that we talk about truly has some relevance and significance in their everyday life. That this God we serve or we say we serve will meet them where they are and deal with them from that place. So yes, I believe the criticism is true, but we often assume, because we often assume that everybody sees God the same way and just automatically believes and trusts in God, because we say they should. <laughs> and we sometimes refuse to change the way we do things because it's the way we've always liked to do it. And it's the way that speaks to us. But what is even more true is that I believe that if all of our churches would preach and teach the word of God as it is written in the manner in which it is given, we could all find that God's word is indeed relevant because it acknowledges who we are today in our flesh, where we've been, how we've been living, and where God calls us to go. <laughs> you do know that God is calling you to something, don't you? <laughs> I don't care how old you are, or how young you are, God is calling all of us to something. And in God's call, God acknowledges where we all have been and who we are. God is for real about who we really are and what we have struggled with. And yet God's grace and God's love in this passage alone calls us from our lowly place to a higher place in God. He says all of these things that you used to do in your old self, you need to kill it. You need to put it to death. Those things that will ultimately destroy your life in God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is directly relevant to you and me today. Oh, I hear God whispering in each one of our ears so as not to embarrass us in polite company. I hear God saying, you used to be involved in sexual acts. Some perverse, dirty sexual acts with the wrong people under the wrong conditions, for the wrong purposes. You used to do unclean and impure things for money or for your own personal gain or just because you had a low view, view of yourself and what you deserved out of your life. You used to operate in lust, wanting the things that you knew you should not have and doing anything you could in order to get them even though you knew they were not yours. Oh, you, you've had some evil desires in your old life. You've wished for somebody else's downfall, somebody else's destruction, back when you were operating in your selfishness and your greed, wanting everything for yourself and for your family, and wanting all the attention and the accolades you could get. Paul says, that's the way you use to walk in your old self. Or why he even goes further to tell us about our anger and our rage that we have in our lives. Anger that causes us to hate others and wish ill will upon our neighbor. Or what about the malice, the malicious, designed to hurt somebody's thoughts that we have. The evil intents, our malicious ways and hateful attitudes. 
may have caused us to hate people we didn't even really know over some petty little misunderstanding or miscommunication instead of loving each other like God has loved us. Amen. Oh, but then he reminds us of our slander, those evil, hateful, wrong, untruthful things we have said against somebody else with the purpose of destroying them or turning others against them, using filthy language that seeks to destroy and not edify anybody. God's word as given to us through Paul is as relevant as anything is ever going to get. Now to be sure, what Paul has to say here does not exactly make us feel all soft and tingly and good when we hear it. <sighs> so if that's the kind of God we're looking for, we'll probably just shut this whole passage out. But if we really want the whole of God's truth, then we will hear this truth that points to the habits of our flesh that probably have caused every one of us in here some pain in our past, when we're honest with ourselves. If we were to tell the truth, each and every one of us here has participated in at least one, if not more, of these behaviors that Paul lists in verses 5 and 8. No, I'm not necessarily talking about right now, but what about back then? Sexual immorality, which is evil, sinful, or otherwise wrong behavior, sexual misconduct, sexual perversion, impurity, unclean, dirty, filthy, corrupt, and wrong activities and thoughts, lust, an intense or unrestrained sexual craving, or an overwhelming desire or craving, Evil desires a very strong feeling to do the wrong or destructive thing or to want that which is wrong in the eyes of God. Greed, that strong wish to have more money, more things, more power than we need. All of which he says is idolatry. Or anger, that strong feeling you get when you think somebody has treated you badly or unfairly and it makes you want to hurt them or destroy them. The rage, the angry, violent behavior, the very strong, intense anger that we display. That malice, the strong feeling of wanting to hurt somebody or be unkind to them. Slandering someone, something bad that we say about someone that is not true and that we hope will damage their reputation. Filthy language, profanity, curse words, or like we used to say, cuss words, derogatory, negative, hurtful words, foul, bad language, lying to each other, just not telling the truth. Yes, I would venture to say we've all been touched by at least one, if not more, of these old behaviors. God's word is quite relevant to each and every one of us, and not only is it truth, but it carries in it the grace of our God. That at least in this passage, the grace does not seek to judge us, but seeks to call us to a higher and a better place. You see, the most relevant word from God is a word of truth and grace. A word that speaks to the truth about our situation, however dark and cold, but a word that also speaks to God's love for us in spite of it all. Let's not get it confused. God knows all and God sees all. What is done in the dark will come out in the light. We cannot hide from God and God here is instructing us through Paul that we don't even need to hide. All we need to do is kill it, kill some things out of our lives, put some things to death so we can truly live victoriously. God says through Paul, since you have taken off your old self, the self that's full of all of these wrong behaviors, since you've taken that off, don't lie to each other. Be truthful with each other. Remember, the truth will make you free. It'll make you free. Hallelujah. Treat each other in a more excellent way, the way of love and unity, faith and kindness. 
2 Corinthians 5 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And as new creatures, Paul says, we take off that old self and we put on our new self. The self that is being renewed in knowledge in the image of our God, where there is neither Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, but Christ is all and is in all, meaning we're all the same. Everybody, no matter what our background or our origin, having the same God in each one of us. Paul says, kill it, put it to death. Whatever it is that hinders you from following God according to God's plan. Get rid of those old habits and behaviors that can bring God's judgment on you and put on something fresh and new. Because Paul recognizes that if you just kill off the old stuff and don't put on anything new, you'll fall back into the place you thought you left. But he says in those concluding verses in uh, or the verses 12 through 14 in chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another, and guess what? Like last week, he says, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, he says, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the word of the Lord. Kill it, kill it, get rid of it, put it to death, let it go. Get free. Amen. It's a simple message. Kill it. Amen. God bless you. Let's all stand. I think I want the choir to sing that I surrender all again. Amen. I surrender all. We want to give an opportunity for anyone here who may not have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to do that right now. To come forward and to give us your hand but to give God your heart. Or maybe you've, you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, but you've been outside of the church, you've been outside of fellowship, and you just want to restore, you just want God to just continue to bless you and speak to your heart, so you at least can feel like you're still connected. We want you to come forward now as our deacons come forward. We'll sing, I Surrender All.
want to surrender to you today, dear God. We want to put to death those things that are destructive in our lives. We want to change who we are. We want to be who you originally intended for us to be. To be open to whatever your spirit says and to love one another as you have loved us. Teach us, oh God, how to take off this churchiness that we have and become your true servants. To touch your people in ways unimaginable because we are allowing you to be God in us. Move, oh God, today within our hearts. Any of those areas that we hold on to and that we try to cling on to, Father God, break us free from it. We might walk freely, freely in your grace, in your mercy. Thank you for your grace. That you're not judging us today, but you are calling us to accountability. You are calling us to be better than we are. That which you intended for us to be. Be with us this day. Oh God, we pray. I surrender all. Surrender. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.